Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining me. Uh, my name is Mark Reedy, and uh, I'll spend the evening giving you a little bit of a rundown of uh, the Urban Engagement Program and how it might apply specifically to your sons and their upcoming uh, program that we'll be starting with. So just bear with me while I set things in motion. And as always, we'll begin with an acknowledgement of country. <clears throat> so we acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional owners and custodians of the country on which we gather. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. In a spirit of humility and reconciliation, we commit ourselves again to listening to the ancient wisdom that resides in the dreaming of Australia's First Nations peoples so that we may learn to live in harmony with one another and with the earth that is our common home. And as always, we'll begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We turn to you, our God, creator and sustainer of all, the one whose life animates all living things, the one whose being we all share. Be our wisdom, be our light, be our listening, be our seeing, be in us the kindness others seek, be in us the gentle love that forgives, be in us justice, peace, courage, creativity and life. Be in us now and always. Amen. Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, pray for us. Live Jesus in our hearts forever. In the name of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, uh, thank you again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me. As as noted here, I, I run the Urban Engagement Program. I want to spend some time just taking you through the rationale behind why we're doing what we're doing, and then some of the nuts and bolts of what will actually happen. I will draw your attention to the fact that you can post questions uh, using the Q&A function and when we get towards the end I will have a quick look at anything that's been posted and just make sure that we've addressed any of your concerns. And so uh, let's let's uh, get started. So I'm sure you're aware of our uh, touchstones that we we as an ERA, EREA college uh, run our, our, our functions by. So uh, liberating education, gospel spirituality, inclusive community and justice and solidarity. These underpin everything that we try and do at St Bernard's College. Uh, and one of the main stays behind developing a program such as the Urban Engagement Program is that uh, in many ways the embodiment of these touchstones is, is theoretical. There's, there's never really uh, in a typical school setting an opportunity to really partake in these in an experiential sort of way. Um, and so there's there's various opportunities for people to be involved sporadically, but nothing that really taps into uh, the opportunities that present themselves uh, in terms of experience and being part of uh, learning in the city. And so that's part of the reason why we've been developed our urban engagement program. The other thing, of course, which is very much, very, I hope very familiar to you, is our college crest and our, our motto, Discere et Agure, to learn and to do. Um, and in developing the program, what we really are is for the boys to learn by doing and being actively involved in their own learning. And then finally, as, as part of our vision for learning, Learning. One of the things we very much want our boys to, to understand is that learning doesn't just happen in school. We want them to engage with, with the idea that there is a world outside the school gates um, and the, the learning opportunities present themselves throughout their lives, not just in terms of what happens in school, but in, in everyday life they are in a position to learn. I really want them to be able to develop their own sense of who they are as learners and and understand how that might impact on them going through their lives as lifelong learners and part of the reality I suppose of uh, I'm, I'm going to skip over this and come back I think but part of the reality of um, of education is this curve if you've had uh, students go through uh, education before you'd be well aware of this and certainly it's something that's not a surprise to anyone who's been involved in education. 
what this graph is showing is uh, the percentage of students who love school uh, as a function of what level of uh, school they're at. And you can see that uh, essentially kids love learning when they're first starting out. They, they love the experience. The uh, Everything is eye opening and uh, ex, you know, ex, able to be explored and they, they love it. Uh, you'll see there though, there's a pretty significant decline as uh, as students get older and become less in an amount of school. Part of this is because I guess school is often set up in a way that which is uh, you know, suited to the vast majority of students, but certainly not all. And I think what we see is the, uh, the disengagement that happens as students come to realise that the way schools typically run is not really uh, the way they like to learn. And you see the sort of bottoms out there at year nine, and as I say, you know, this wouldn't be a surprise to anyone who's had students go through into senior levels of the school before. You'll see there's a little uptick as they go past year nine. And I think part of this is because students have become uh, aware of alternative pathways, they become very much more aware of who or the sort of learning they like to do, and they're given a more of an opportunity to choose the types of subjects that suit them. And so you see that sort of little uptick. But at that point, I think people are so disengaged with their learning that uh, they never really gain back that sense of love of learning. And that's really what I want to try and sort of arrest with, with the program. I want the boys to be able to experience learning as uh, a joy again. I want to try and reignite that love of learning, but also make it uh, perhaps obvious to them how best they learn uh, so that they can then bring some of those skills and that uh, re-engagement back into their normal classroom situation. Now we'll just go back to this. Um, I come across this uh, this uh, diagram many, many years ago and it's always uh, resonated with me. And as a result, I very much in my own teaching practices have tried to implement this as much as possible. So my, my modus operandi is to talk as little as possible. Well, you wouldn't think so given the way I'm rabbiting on tonight, but um, what this is showing of course is the uh, the amount of knowledge that students will retain depending on the sort of teaching methods they're exposed to. And you can see there that you know, lecturing is, is very, very minimal in terms of how much students will retain, simply because they're not engaged in, uh, in actively learning. They're just sitting there um, and hopefully absorbing at least some of this. Uh, it might surprise you to find that things like reading and you know, looking at audio visual stuff also doesn't particularly uh, engage students uh, in terms of their own learning and as, as a result they don't really retain much as well. This is something that probably would surprise people given that students typically these days very much love to uh, look at audio visual stuff uh, and, and their first port of call will be to go straight to their computer and sort of look up something on YouTube about how to do something. Uh, um, what I've always tried to do as a result of coming across uh, this idea is to make sure that uh, my students are as actively engaged as possible. Uh, and this whole idea of practice by doing and, and the, the ultimate, the holy grail of boys teaching others uh, knowledge that they've gained themselves is uh, something that I've always tried to incorporate in my own classes. and. I think have uh, you know drawn a benefit from it in terms of the boys' understanding of their, their learning that we're trying to achieve. And the reality is that's what I'm trying to do with the urban engagement program. We, we have the boys um, actively out doing rather than sitting in a room listening to someone talk to them about things. Uh, and that, that would be the, the strong basis of what we're trying to do. <laughs> The, sorry, going back here, this this whole point of this graph, of course, is that by year nine, a good two thirds of students are pretty disengaged with their learning. That's not to say that's for everyone, of course, obviously there's a 30% or a good third are still quite enjoying school, 
and arguably those are the boys who the way schools run is, is most suitable for and the remainder are sort of just there because they're required to be there and not particularly enjoying it. That graph, of course, represents something we've known for, for many, many years, at, you know, a quarter of a century at least. And uh, so year nine is a time of transition. And this idea was really the impetus behind our development of the original Santa Monica program, the idea that we wanted to take the boys out of their normal learning take them away from their families and work in community a long way away with the idea that they are forced to work together. Um, they don't have parents around to help them out, so they're, they're reliant on their community of uh, fellow students to really be able to, to achieve what they need to. And this, this bridge to adults is something that happens in many, many societies where, where young uh, adolescents are taken away and introduced to the idea of being adult, go through a process and then come back as adults. Um, and, and that's really the aim of the Santa Monica program. One of the things that's really uh, been driven home to me through my many years at St Bernard's is that when we talk to the year 12s, invariably they refer back to the Santa Monica program as you know a, a seminal experience for them. It, it was hugely influential, possibly not even at the time that it was going on, but as they have got older and they've reflected back, they, they've realised how important it was for them to be part of that experience. The reality is, of course, that um, it's, it's, it's four weeks in, in year nine and uh, as such an isolated experience. And so we wanted to sort of try and tap into that a bit more, but uh, extend the experience a little bit. The point of the Urban Engagement Program is that we, uh, in a similar way to Santa Monica, we take them to an environment that they're probably not used to. Um, the, the city environment is a very adult one. Most of the people in the city are adult um, and they're going about their business, they're working. Um, and so the environment itself is very adult. Um, where we have the boys for our base is also extremely adult. And I'll talk more about that later on. But the city environment is, you know, probably as alien to the boys as the, the coastal forest environment of Santa Monica, but arguably more important because it's you know, almost certainly where they will spend uh, a lot of their adult life uh, in and around the city, perhaps with further education, perhaps with work, certainly traveling in and out. And so um, this is what we're after. We want the boys to feel uh, like they're part of a more adult environment and become used to work working in that sort of environment. We also want them to be able to take more control of their learning. Um, I think that's what's often missing for the boys is that um, wherever they're going, they, they have an adult telling them what to do, um, whether it be parents, whether it be teachers, they, uh, as a result, barely have to look up from their phones uh, to, to make their own decisions. And so we quite deliberately put the onus back upon the boys. Uh, we let them have those opportunities to make decisions around how they will deal with particular tasks and the topics in some cases. And they they very quickly get very tired of my uh, constant referring to what I would say is the, the mantra of the Urban Engagement Program, which is personal responsibility. Um, I, I insist that the boys take personal responsibility for their their learning, their outcomes, their behaviour, to being in places on time. So I, I don't accept if they come in late and say, well, the, the tram was late. Um, it's their responsibility to be where they've got to be when they're supposed to be there. Uh, and so I, I deliberately don't accept excuses. Um, I, I insist that they take personal responsibility for themselves. 
as part of this and as part of the process that they're undergoing, I'm also hoping that they develop then a better understanding of themselves as, as young men and, and as learners and how they might take that understanding and use it to benefit themselves as they go back into school and back into uh, the ongoing learning processes that will continue for at least a number of years going through St Bernard's. Um, part of this whole process in, in trying to develop this adult understanding of themselves is the idea that we, we insist that they work in teams um, and not necessarily teams that they would ordinarily choose. So in other words, mimicking what's likely to happen to them in an adult work environment where they will be, uh, their boss will simply say, here's the work that I want you to do, here's the guys you're doing with it, doing it with, off you go get it done. And the opportunity to develop the skills to be able to do that uh, and to work with people who uh, they perhaps wouldn't ordinarily choose to work with, but are required to. And even the, the opportunity to recognize the different sort of skill sets that different people bring to a, a particular task and how to tap into those. Um, this is something we, we tend to expect that as, as humans, we, we can do this automatically, but it's something that the, the boys need to be uh, taught and it, it forms part of the deliberate scaffolding of what we do when we're in the city. Um, I'd like to take a few uh, moments now just to talk about week by week what will happen so you get some sense of what's going on. I hope you've had an opportunity to read the, uh, the documentation that's been sent home, which sort of gives a little bit more of an overview of well as well as, uh, as what goes on. So we, we have four touchstones uh, and somewhat fortuitously we have four weeks and so we allocate uh, one touchstone as the guiding principle for each week uh, and then develop a theme from that. And so week one, liberating education. I think the very fact that we're out of school in the city is by in itself um, liberating education. Um, uh, and so the theme for this week is exploration, just simply orientating themselves in uh, what is a highly complex uh, environment and being able to get around quickly, efficiently and to learn a little bit about themselves, but also uh, the group that they are working with for the first two weeks. And so we've, we've got uh, a guided exploration process, I suppose, over the course of the week uh, in their small groups, uh, which have been allocated or will be. Um, now, um, I, I should be right up front here and say, I have no idea uh, about your son. I, I don't know your son. Uh, and so I don't do the group allocation. I leave that to the year level leaders who, who do an excellent job. And so they will allocate groups. Um, one of the first things that comes up from the boys is, can we change our groups? And the answer to that is no, you can't. Um, the whole point of this is to learn how to get along with people, to uh, get to know people who are different to who you normally would hang around with and get an understanding of the skills that they bring with them. Um, as, as they're exploring the city, they're also exploring themselves and exploring who their teammates are. So much of the week is involved with uh, the boys choosing from a variety of um, exploratory activities, uh, looking at different aspects of Melbourne. So they're required to explore, for example, the historical side of Melbourne, the indigenous side, uh, the cultural side. Um, we also have um, sort of modern Melbourne. And then um, and now, would you believe I'm blanking on the last one? Um, I'll come back to that one. Um, and so the whole point of this is to give them a bit of a broad understanding of Melbourne as a, a city. Um, we do have uh, currently one class excursion uh, uh, which sort of taps into this and it's sort of more about the history of Melbourne where we go to the Melbourne Museum as a class um, and look at uh, the Melbourne story. So you get a sense of how Melbourne has developed. And uh, towards the end of uh, the first week, we also introduced them to their task for week two, which is to look at, uh, we've called it here the big question, but it's really looking at issues uh, that uh, are related to living in the city, uh, central business district. 
uh, and that will be done in their current allocated groups and will need to be completed by the end of week two. I'll talk more about the assessment as we go further along. When we move into week two, we, we shift to our second touchstone, gospel spirituality, and from this we've extracted the theme of giving. Um, there's uh, now no longer the boys exploring. Uh, it's now a focus on them working as a team to uh, answer their, their big question and come up with a, uh, a brief uh, description of what it is, uh, talking to um, expert consultants, they have to find stakeholders, they need to create public surveys, they need to delve into the history of the issue and then uh, provide their own point of view and potential solutions to the, the problems that they, they've encountered. Um, and at the end of the week they will have created a display board which they will share with you at our final, uh, final family evening on the last day of the program. As well as this, as this, we have uh, three typical whole class excursions. We go to the Shrine of Remembrance, which I, I absolutely love going to, and I think the, the boys do as well. It's, it's, it's awe-inspiring, but it's also a reminder of uh, the, the heartache and sorrow that comes from conflict. Um, and as, as I will often say in communication with, uh, with each group throughout the year, the what's going on in the Ukraine at the moment sort of makes that even more poignant um, at this moment. We also uh, take a, a really good look, I think, at uh, something which, you know, is, is in the boy's face from the basically the first day they step off the train uh, into the city central business district, and that is the, the whole um, homelessness issue. It's very much there right in front of them, pretty much everywhere they look. And so uh, I think the opportunity to sort of delve into some of the misconceptions around homelessness, uh, how it's caused and what can be done to, to resolve it is really important for the boys and their understanding of some of the issues that come out, out of this. So we, we talked to uh, City Mission, uh, the front yard organisation. They uh, particularly deal with youth homelessness. And then uh, we also talked to the big issue publishers who are working with long term homeless people to provide a, a way of integrating them back into society and the tremendous work that they do there as well. So by the end of week two, they should have completed their first uh, group task. When we move into week three, uh, our touchstone is justice and solidarity. And from this, we've extracted the, the theme of sustainability. And again, there are three whole class excursions that sort of tap into this. Uh, and again, this is one of the issues that they will notice as they're going around the city is that uh, the idea of pollution and rubbish and, and waste is, is very much uh, in front of them as well. And so they get an opportunity to sort of delve into ways in which this can be um, combated personally and also what's happening around the city in terms of dealing with this. Week three also sees the boys move into their second group assessment task. This is a passion project. Uh, and again, I'll talk more about exactly what that entails later on. But they have two weeks to work on this and this time, uh, very excitedly, I, I think they, they are able to select their own groups. Um, it, it's interesting to allow the boys at the end of the four weeks to reflect back on how the two different groups they've been in have worked. Um, often what we do find is that um, those allocated groups tend to actually work more cohesively than the groups where they select themselves. And that doesn't mean that they, the self-selected groups don't get on well, but often they find it difficult to complete work quickly and efficiently because as friends, they're used to taking liberties, whereas if they're not friends, it's easier to call people to account. And so it's often a, a an eye-opening reflection for them to realise that uh, sometimes allocated groups are actually a better option 
because it divorces them from the need to call out their friends who are not completing what they are supposed to do and they're, they're not being responsible. So it's something for them to just reflect on as they move into uh, the more senior years where often group work is a, a big part of what they do. Our final week, uh, uh, the, the touchstone for this is inclusive community and it, oh, the obvious one from this would be uh, the idea of culture, multiculture, how our own culture and background creates our identity and um, influences the way in which we interact with the world. Um, so again, whole class excursions picking up this theme. Um, we, we attend the Jewish Museum. Now, I would point out here, not the Holocaust Museum, uh, which is a very specific sort of uh, period, which is horrific. But what we're really aiming for here is uh, for the boys to get a better understanding of Jewish culture and, and the way the Jewish religion plays out in, in the lives of Jewish people. It's uh, something that's uh, completely alien to the boys. Uh, no, I think they don't realise that there's a completely separate language, there's a completely separate uh, approach to life that is, is there alongside us. And uh, the, the rise of uh, anti-Semitism that we've been seeing lately, I think this is really, really important. Um, we also go to the Immigration Museum, uh, not to much look at the Immigration Museum itself, but to deal with a uh, display they have there, which is reflecting on how the boys' cultural background is uh, in a large part what dictates uh, the, their own self-identity. And then finally, on the last day of our um, program, we go on an Indigenous walk along the Yarra, just looking at uh, the way in which the local Indigenous people were impacted by the uh, creation of Melbourne. Um, this uh, also leads into a, a retreat experience. We'll have a, a liturgy to celebrate the fact that we've got through our program. Um, all of our work on the Passion Project will be completed and we, we look forward to a family celebration on the last day in the evening where the boys will present their work to their families um, and we have a bit of a, a bite to eat and a drink together before we go our separate ways it's a really lovely way of finishing things off and um, you know, I am very much buoyed by the experience of being there and, and seeing the pride that parents have in the work that their, their boys have done and they really do do outstanding work. Um, I've mentioned a couple of these tasks, the, the group tasks, so the passion project and the, the big question, the issues in the central business district. There is one other assessment task which is uh, an individual one and it's ongoing throughout the whole program and that is where we ask them to do reflective journaling of their experiences every day, just sort of having some time to sit and think about what they've seen and experienced and how that's impacted on them. Um, so it's, it's not a recounting of the day, it's a, a touching on this happened and how it made them feel or what it made them think or something that uh, caused them to wonder uh, about something. It, it's a, a really good process for the boys to go to uh, go through in terms of debriefing from the day. And also it will help to provide you with a bit of an insight into what your son's experiencing. Um, and certainly sets them up in good stead because we, we have a task here where they're effectively wanting, I'll skip forward here, we're wanting them to write 300 to 500 words. Um, and typically they their first thought on this is, oh my goodness, how am I going to do this? Because they're just not used to writing and, and reflecting. But uh, with the scaffolding that's provided for them and the guiding questions, if they work their way through that, they will find that they're churning this out very, very easily. Um, and they're able to develop the skills of sort of reflecting on what's happening and how that might have impacted on them and it's one of the key things that we want them to get out of this is that they become more reflective of what's going on why do they feel the way that they do and uh, if that's impacting on the way in which they are interacting with others what can they do about that 
So we're looking for well presented and well thought out notes at the end of each day reflecting on their experiences. Um, the first two weeks we use that as a time for practice drafting and we, we give feedback on what they're doing and then we will assess the uh, work in the last two weeks of the program. Just skipping back, um, the uh, issues in the CBD, here's an, a list of uh, possible topics. We, we typically use the same ones over and over again because they are the, the key issues. Um, now that's not to say that every display that comes up is exactly the same and it's because these uh, issues are actually really quite broad and so often the kids then get a chance to brainstorm and think about different aspects and settle on one very very specific aspect of the issue that they want to explore and so while we get some repetition um, often even though the boys are doing the same issues as, as other groups have done in the past they uh, are attacking it in a slightly different way and so it's new and fresh for me which is uh, wonderful because otherwise I keep going over the same stuff again and so it, it's really good to see the way they are able to think outside the box and see the way in which the issue can be addressed or different aspects of the, the issue that can be worked on. Um, as we said they, they have a week where in their small group they need Need to decide how they're going to approach it but they need to come up with some sort of historical background to the issue um, be able to describe the actual impacts that this issue has on uh, living in the central business district talk to uh, expert consultants they need to find one and contact them by phone uh, and the same thing for stakeholders it's interesting that the boys are often very reticent to do this they're not used to talking to people on the phone or in person they're much more comfortable with the idea of texting one another and so this sort of really does push them out of their comfort zone a little bit uh, but it's surprising the the sense of achievement that they get when they're successful in this um, we've had some of the boys have been able to interview the lord mayor we've had um, the chief health officer uh, brett sutton interviewed we've had uh, politicians interviewed so they've been able to really strike out and uh, in some cases strike it lucky and getting someone who's happy to talk to them uh, and also sometimes being outright rejected uh, and that's an important learning process in itself um, from all of their work uh, they, they do a sort of a media search to get a sense of what's what's being said in the media about the issue they're working on and then they produce uh, a display to to inform the general public about this what it is their own point of view and of course uh, a big focus on potential solutions to the problems um, we've also talked a little bit about the passion project this one of course is the self-selected groups which they're pleased about you'll note that this time though it's self-selected groups of up to four so what this means is the boys can because it's a passion project is something that they are themselves personally interested in uh, they might not be able to find that there are four boys who are interested in the same thing um, and i don't want to curtail uh, the options for them so they can be as few as two uh, we won't let anyone work on something like this on their own but as few as two and as many as four so two three or four students uh, almost invariably we have someone who comes up and says can we have five and the answer to that is no they may not so essentially the bigger the group the more opportunities for one person or two people to do very little sit back and watch others do it um, rather than be directly and heavily involved i want to make sure that they all actually get the experience of being involved in, in these projects the boys are asked to choose sort of one aspect of uh, Melbourne. So again, very, very broad and open-ended um, you know, requirements in terms of uh, so environmental, um, criminal underground, uh, historical, sporting, cultural, musical. Um, you know, it was very, very wide ranging, but then not just say um, 
pick that and then choose the most obvious feature. And this is the challenging bit for me and for them. Um, so often we'll have boys who say, well, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in art, so I'm going to do the, or we're going to do the National Gallery of Victoria. And okay. Um, but everyone knows that that's there. Everyone knows what's in there. And, you know, for me personally, uh, I've had two or three groups who've said, this is what we want to do. And I'm thinking, oh, okay. Yeah, and similarly, um, you know, I like sports, so I want to do the MCG or I, you know, I want to look at Collingwood. Um, you know, so they're, they're going straight for something that's very, very familiar and probably something that they don't really need to do much exploring on. In other words, it, it's a bit of a cop out. Uh, so I want them to delve beyond what you'd find in any tourist uh, um, information centre and find something that's really quite distinctly Melbourne and different. Something they actually have to explore and find out themselves rather than sort of just rehashing things that they already know or can you know, even very easily find. They're asked to present this as a five minute documentary, um, which again is, is challenging for the boys. They, they find it difficult to um, perform essentially. And so while some people take to this like a duck to water, others find this quite difficult. And again, this whole idea of pushing them out of their comfort zone uh, to stretch them, stretch their skills is a really important part of this. Um, the boys often think five minutes will have that done really, really easily, but it's it's far more challenging than they think. Um, but again, I, I think you will be incredibly blown away by what they will produce by the end of our, our two weeks with this program and this project. We've already talked about the journal reflections. Um, I guess what you'll notice here is that um, the, the program doesn't really deal with what you might refer to as normal uh, school subjects. So while we might touch on history or civics or um, even sciences and things like that, it's not really the focus. We're, we're really wanting the boys to be able to extend these sort of key capabilities that form up behind all of the subjects that they learn, but often aren't really assessed in any great depth. What we're doing in this program is allowing us to look at how these capabilities are developing and actually do a, a proper assessment of, of how they're going and how they're progressing. And so in particular, say personal and social capabilities around the idea of being reflective, as in with the journal, or developing teamwork skills, which is the key part of what we're doing. So the program is designed to allow us to actually assess how these boys are progressing in these areas. Uh, and you know, obviously one thing that's really going to stand out with all of this is uh, our ability to see how they go with critical and creative thinking. In other words, problem solving, because for large portions of the time, they will be out unsupervised and having to make their own decisions about things. Uh, there are some curriculum areas that we sort of typically cover because of what we're doing. Um, and so obviously the, the digital technologies fits in very nicely with the, uh, the last assessment task, the passion project. Um, this is where we're at. Uh, the, the base is the Catholic Theological College and we're there four days a week. Um, now, I would point out, of course, that while we often will have a staff member just in the city roaming and sort of catching up with the boys in an ad hoc way, um, there's always someone at uh, CTC if, if the boys need to go back there. Um, so that's where we are for four days of the week. Uh, on Tuesdays, the boys will be back at St Bernard's on our Essendon campus uh, and we'll talk about what they do in each of the these days as we go along. So uh, that's where we are. It, it's very, very, uh, I like where we are because it's sort of just on the outskirts of the city. So it's, it's easy to get there, but it's also just a little separated. Uh, and I think that's nice. So the, the closest train station is Parliament Station. 
uh, and from there it's a 10 minute walk or if you're really desperate you can catch a tram and it will take you out to the front of CTC uh, with only a 100 meter walk. I tend to do the, the walk from Parliament Station because I like the exercise. The boys for some reason don't do that. Um, so here's a typical day uh, and realistically we would usually only be at CTC for half an hour in the morning, half an hour in the afternoon, and the rest of the time the boys will be either at CTC or out. And, and the key part of this is that um, for each group that comes through, I don't know what they're going to be doing until the, the day comes and they, they make uh, their plans and they tell me what they're going to do. So we would typically be uh, coming in at nine o'clock. Uh, we have a quick reflection, talk about what's happening for the day. If there's any sort of um, you know, whole class excursion, we'll talk through the logistics, talk about what they need to do for the day. And then from there, the activities will be either we're going somewhere as a whole group, as the whole class, or they're in small groups and they're making a decision that for a particular day or part of the day, they need to stay at CTC to work on the material that they've already gathered, or they need to go out and collect information, take photos, talk to people, um, and, and sort of gather the information they need. So in other words, we're working on our projects, but what that will look like is determined by the way the team wants to develop the process. Um, and so this is really the biggest difference that the boys, of course, notice is that it's not me telling them this is what you will do. It, it really comes down to them as a group looking at what needs to be done, allocating tasks and deciding how they're going to approach it. Um, again, they're not used to this. Uh, it takes a while for them to get used to the whole idea that they have to make the decision and again they have to be personally responsible for the outcomes that come from that. Uh, we invariably have the boys back all on site uh, by around 2.30 where we will do a little bit of a debrief and look what we're going on there and they'll then think about their journal writing for the evening. Uh, we'll often talk about what's going to be happening on the next day that we uh, uh, are on site and then we'll, we'll work from there. So that's a typical day. On Tuesdays, however, um, because we don't want the boys to have to choose between uh, being involved in the program and continuing to represent the school in ACC, we, we have the boys at St Bernard's, you know, at the Essendon campus for the day on Tuesdays. Um, this actually gives us a really important opportunity. Um, one of the things that I'm very much uh, wanting the boys to have is an understanding of uh, financial maths. They, they'll be getting to the point where they will be wanting to have a job, a part-time job, and getting some understanding of the idea of um, you know, normal rates versus penalty rates and overtime the idea of the difference between a salary and a wage, um, the idea of how to deal with credit uh, before they get to 18 and get their wonderful present from a bank which says here's a free credit card, understanding what credit uh, actually means. Um, in particular, I am very much wanting to get them to avoid this whole idea that if we can't afford it now, let's just nimble it. Um, the, the whole idea that you know, there's a fluffy bunny that will lend you money and I really want them to understand that if they do that it won't be the fluffy bunny that comes to the door wanting the money back um, and they can get themselves into um, you know, significant financial difficulties by not understanding how this whole process works um, and that uh, I think is a really important um, concept for them to come across. The other thing which this time allows us to do though is also look at uh, the careers curriculum, especially designed to get them to be better prepared to think about how they want to organise their educational pathways in year 11 and 12. Um, mm -hmm. I know those uh, boys will have 
completed their subject selections uh, at this point and in some ways have already started to think about pathways. But the whole point of this is to get them to really consider who they are and delve a little bit more with your help uh, into the sort of learner they are, uh, feeding on the stuff that we're doing in the program so that they're able to make really considered decisions about what they want to do as they move through the school. OK, so more nuts and bolts then. Things that uh, they really need to have with them um, when they come into the program, uh, they need to bring their laptop with them. Um, it, it's probably important they don't uh, think that they're going to carry it around everywhere. I want the boys to be thinking more about uh, life as uh, perhaps similar to a university. We travel light. Uh, we don't take more than we need to because they'll be moving around a lot. So laptop is important, but uh, we leave that at the base. It'll be locked up and secure and they can then use that when they come back in. They really do need a mobile phone and I know that most of them will have that, but if, if there are any students who don't, it's really important that we are able to communicate and they will also typically use their mobile phones as a camera for recording things that uh, they're, they're encountering as they go along. Um, so the boys uh, will share their phone number with me uh, and uh, I will share my school mobile phone number with them uh, so that they are able to contact me and I am able to contact them. And this is a critical part of our uh, means of ensuring their safety is that there's constant communication backwards and forwards. Um, they should bring a clipboard with them and paper and sort of pens and pencils and things like that. I've got a note here, some money or a debit card. I notice most of the kids tend to have a debit card. Um, some of them have cash. Um, hopefully, if they have cash, they're not bringing too much and also sort of not be expecting to, to spend a lot of money in the city. One thing that is really important is that they, they must have a MyKey card and it, it needs to be active and topped up. And um, I will be talking to all of the board Boys tomorrow uh, during period two. And um, one of the things we'll talk about is the idea that uh, often boys who don't use public transport a lot don't really understand how this works. But if you don't swipe on uh, with your Mikey card at, for example, Lisbon Station, when you get into the city stations, you can't get out uh, because it registers that you haven't actually paid. And typically there is also then a long line of a little group of authorised officers waiting to scoop people up and uh, take details and issue fines. So it's really important they understand this whole idea that it is a swipe on, swipe off idea. The other thing I would uh, say to the boys and to you is that, uh, you know, we're, we're, it's spring is about to be sprung. It's going to be sort of warmer, but uh, it's also probably typical that it'll be wild weather. So pay attention to the weather. Um, if it's likely to be cold, dress appropriately. And I'll talk more about uh, dress in a, in a minute. But you know, if, if where, um, rain is predicted, it's probably a good idea to bring a little bolly with you, uh, particularly if the group is planning to be out in the city a lot. Um, what will be provided. We do have uh, access for the boys with uh, an, an iPad and a stylus. Uh, typically, um, we've offered that. Um, the boys typically want to use their their phones and that, that's fine by me. Um, I sometimes think that an iPad uh, will provide a slightly big screen that might be more worthwhile, but um, I'm, I'm happy to let the boys make that decision themselves. Obviously, we'll have Wi-Fi access at uh, our base so they can continue to work on projects when they come in. And we have some really good workspaces with our own uh, room that we have there at uh, the Catholic Theological College. And we also have access to the, the college library, which is, is really fabulous. Um, so nice big open spaces, uh, little sort of separate rooms glassed in that we can use for, for small group work and also corrals for individual work. So it's actually really well set up. What is important is the boys don't bring their normal large school bag with them. Um, when we're, particularly when we're moving in large groups, uh, a big bag on the back just takes up so much room 
on crowded public transport. So a small sort of date pack, perhaps similar to one that they might have had at uh, Santa Monica would be really good. And um, yeah, they shouldn't really bring anything and it's valuable, it could be lost. If it's not needed for the program, there's, there's no reason to have it with them. <sighs> okay, so attendance. Um, we'll have the boys signing in as they come in and whenever they return to base, whenever they're going out uh, unsupervised, they're going to need to fill in a form which will say who's going, where are they going to, who are they going to be interacting with, how they're getting there when they expect to return and, and our typical process then is for them to send me a group selfie when they get there uh, so that I can see that they they have arrived safely and they're all still together and then typically we'll have them send group selfies every sort of hour or so just so we can still keep that contact with them and see that things are going well. Um, it's really important for the boys to understand that you know, we won't let them leave on their own during the day. They, they can't go out by themselves. Um, sometimes they'll be sent out to get some lunch. Uh, and this, in this case, we expect them to go together. Um, and certainly if there's sort of one person going, they can't go on their own. They have to go with someone else. Um, and so this, uh, we, we know where they are, essentially. Um, Students who are absent or late, we, we have the same expectations as if they're attending uh, the SNM campus. Now, um, this is where things will sort of vary a little bit. Um, typically, what we'd find is uh, a boy's going to be sick or is going to be late. The parent will contact the school and I'd, I'd like to uh, encourage that, of course. One of the difficulties that that presents for us, though, is that because we're so isolated from the school, it often takes a little while for that to filter through. So. I'm then typically calling either the student or the parent to say, okay, you haven't arrived, what's going on? And so it's probably worthwhile, uh, and I'm, I'm hesitant to ask you to double up on things, but it, it's, it's really important that uh, you contact me on the phone number that's here on the screen in front of you. So 0403 249216, that's my school mobile phone number. Um, just letting me know if if your son's going to be absent or late. Um, if if you do that, I will automatically pass that on to uh, school uh, at the school for attendance records anyway. So if you want to do that instead of contacting the school, that's that's perfectly fine. If you're happy enough to do both, uh, probably even better. But uh, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 it's really important that I know whether you know, a, a boy is going to be here or not, rather than having to sort of worry uh, that they haven't yet arrived. Um, in this current climate, of course, if your son's feeling unwell, um, please don't send him in. And this is not even necessarily about COVID. Uh, if you're sort of feeling like he's a bit fluey or got a cold or a bit gastro or something, the last thing we want is for this to be sort of passed around through the group. Um, to make other boys sick. So if he's not well, please keep him home. Could also ask you know, if possible, I know that this is sometimes not possible, but if possible, please don't make appointments for your son during the day as um, this is going to take him away from um, you know, his group and it will impact on the way the group's able to do their work. So if you can avoid it, please uh, don't make appointments during the day. Um, now, of course, you may well put your son on the train and um, he will sort of make his way and something may happen which unexpectedly delays him. Um, I expect that students in that situation will also contact me and explain that they're going to be late. Um, and the same thing would happen if uh, students have said in, in their sign out form, we'll be back at 1.30 and they, they find that they're actually going to be back later than that. I expect them to contact me um, just so that I know what's happening and what's going on. Okay, some general matters. Uh, one of the big sort of ticket items, I suppose, is the idea that uh, you know the boys will be unsupervised for large portions of the time. How will we uh, know that they're going to be safe? And you know this also applies to, I suppose, traveling in and out on the public uh, transport system. Uh, we know that they're safe. 
And the reality is that, um, you know, the city itself is actually quite safe. Um, it, it's full of adults who will help you sign if there are issues. Uh, and the public transport uh, system is also typically extremely safe at the times that we'll be using it. Um, our, our biggest focus on safety though for the boys is the fact that we want them to stick together in their group. So it's, it's absolutely imperative and I'll really emphasize this with your sons tomorrow is that the group of four is their safety net. It provides them with uh, numbers, uh, to support them, um, it provides four brains to deal with problems rather than just one, and the opportunity to um, sort of interact together in a small group that is large enough to provide that sort of measure of safety, but also small enough to allow them to move around quickly and efficiently, I think is a really key part of what's going on. The other side of this course is that uh, they will be wearing their school uniform and that in itself also adds to their safety. It signals to all the people around that the, the boys are there for a purpose. Uh, they have teachers who will be monitoring them. They have parents who love them. Uh, so they're not just sort of random teenagers wandering the city for no particular reason. They're there for a reason. And so this is one of the reasons why we, we absolutely insist that the boys wear their school uniform um, and wear it well and wear it with pride. Um, we mentioned earlier about keeping an eye on the weather and if it's going to be cold, dress appropriately. And by that I mean, if it's going to be cold, then you put on layers. So a, a t-shirt under your shirt, then a jumper, then a blazer. Um, so there's no need for boys to be thinking, I'll just put on a, a shirt and then wear a big puffer jacket and a hoodie. Um, the, the uniform is designed to be warm. And so um, that's that's what we expect them to do. Uh, um, if it's likely to be cold, black gloves would be a, a good measure. A black scarf would be a good measure. A beanie will be taken off them because it's not part of the uniform. Um, and so that's something just to keep aware of. Uh, the other side of this is uh, that the boys will be on their feet significantly more than they would be um, in a normal school day. And so I'm quite happy for the boys to come in in runners. I much, much prefer that they be black or mostly black. I have one kid come in with the most lurid pair of yellow runners that looked appalling. Um, so um, I much prefer that these be black or mostly black runners. But it's important that they're comfortable and able to move around easily. Um, in, in terms of food, um, they will find that uh, buying food in the city is, is expensive. Um, for many of the boys, that doesn't seem to phase them. I don't know if it's because they feel like they've got plenty of money or because they feel that mum and dad will just top it up um, if they need to. But um, often uh, boys will prefer to buy food. I, I try to encourage them to at least uh, think about bringing food from home. Uh, but if they are buying food, I also try to encourage them to extend themselves out of their comfort zone and perhaps steer away from Macca's and KFC, you know, even Sushi Hub. And just, you know, there are literally thousands of places to buy food in the city. Um, and I, I try to encourage them to at least explore different possibilities rather than just going back to the same old, same old. I have to report uh, I don't have a great deal of success with that, but I do keep trying on that one. Um, the final thing there is uh, homework. Um, and typically, I will not give the boys homework. Um, they, they will be required to do their uh, journaling at home and sort of perhaps interact with you in the development of that and then submit it before they will be allowed to go out the next day. So they have to have it done before they can leave CTC in the morning to go out in their group. And it means then that their group may be delayed if someone hasn't done it. Uh, so again, the responsibility comes back to them to, to do what they need to do. But other than that, um, it's my expectation that the, the group themselves will look at the work they have to do and make a decision that 
um, you know, something needs to be done in preparation for the next day and allocate who's going to do what and get it done. So the, the responsibility falls back on the boys to make those decisions for themselves. Um, and there's been some surprising outcomes of that. So students who have asked their parents, can they come back in, in the, on the weekend to complete some stuff that they didn't manage to get done? So the real boys really saying to take control of um, the tasks that they've got to do, um, which is very uh, uplifting for me. Um, I mentioned that I'm going to talk with your sons tomorrow. Um, and so this is, uh, we'll do a pre-program introduction where we'll talk to you about uh, how to get in and out. Um, and I'll explain where they're going. Now, um, on the first day, um, I will uh, guarantee that I will be at Essendon Station on the Monday at 8.10. And I will travel in on the 817 train. And if there were boys who just happened to be there and happened to be on the same train as me, that would not bother me in the slightest. And so typically I have more or less most of the boys uh, on the same train with me. Um, after that, I really do sort of push it back to them and say, okay, you know how to get there now. It's up to you to, to find your way there. Um, and when we get there, we'll I'll, I'll conduct them to here. And this is what the uh, uh, Catholic Theological College front door looks like. And so typically we have the boys arrive and they can wait outside on the bench you can see there and we'll come and get them uh, at nine o'clock to come in. Um, but this is what it looks like. Um, just a reminder, face masks are still mandatory on public transport and so the boys should have a face mask and should be wearing it and we'll keep insisting on this, particularly when we're with them. And we would very much encourage them, and I would like you to encourage them as well to, to, to keep doing this even when they're unsupervised. Um, it, it's, it's easy to dismiss this as just uh, overreaction, but the reality is the tram lines that are right outside CTC service four or five different hospitals and so a lot of the people who travel on those will be either sick themselves or going to visit people who are sick and in that sense it's really important that we are cognizant of the need for those people to be protected. We'll also go through tomorrow protocols and expectations uh, of what we expect of the boys and mostly this is pretty much what we expect of them at St Bernard's. Uh, just in a normal school day, just standard behaviours. But there are a couple of sort of very particular ones that relate to the fact that we are in the city. Um, and so we'll go through that with the boys tomorrow. Um, how can you find out more? Um, hopefully the fact that you're listening to me now means that you've seen obviously my email to you inviting you to this and attached to that was uh, a copy of the Urban Engagement Handbook risk assessment uh, that we do when we monitor every program to check that it's still valid. And I also sent a typical program outline so you get some idea of what we do. Um, you will also, uh, I was, uh, as part of my discussion with the boys tomorrow, I will send home with them a consent form which will ask you to specifically consent to the idea that your son will be uh, in, in many ways unsupervised for large portions of time. Um, it's it's uh, something that's so significantly different to what we would normally do on excursions that uh, uh, we've been asked to have this as a separate form apart from the usual sim web permissions that you will give for any other normal excursion. That will also be coming and will be out later on this week and ask you to give your formal approval for being involved with the, the um, urban engagement program. But we will ask that you complete the separate consent form as well. Uh, if you wanted to find out more information, of course, uh, the Urban Engagement page is on the Year 9 level page on my SBC, and you can see there with my lovely red dot, uh, that's where it is. It will fill you in with uh, what happens every uh, week, 
and with lots of uh, resources and things there, perhaps far more than you need to know, but uh, if you want to get a sense of what we're doing, that's a good place to start. Now, um, Group 3 dates, hopefully you're already aware of this, uh, but we'll be beginning your program on uh, next Monday, the 29th of August, and this will sort of three weeks of this term and then uh, go into term four and finish on Friday the 7th of October, which is the Friday of the first week of term four. Um, just to note there, you know, there are times when interruptions occur. At this point, I'm not expecting any for this program, but do be aware that uh, there is, uh, this is an overlap program. So we will still have group two with us next week for their final week of their program, as well as your sons uh, there for their first week. Um, we, we've actually done this before. Um, it, it's a, an interesting exercise trying to deal with 56 boys in the city all doing different things. Um, but it, it works pretty well. So we obviously yeah, we, we have extra staff there because we've got more kids. Um, but just be aware that there is an overlap program. The other thing which I do need to let you know is that I will be taking long service leave uh, from the end of this term. And so Shanette Glynn will be taking over my role. Uh, I'm uh, expecting that Shanette will be with us for at least the first week and hopefully even more of the program so that uh, she will actually be staying, spending a lot more time with your boys in the lead up to the handover uh, and then she will take over from me in term four. The other thing that we've got is uh, obviously again, uh, and I hope you're already aware of this uh, and I hope you are uh, able to attend, is our family evening, which is held on uh, the last day of each program. Uh, in this case, uh, for you, Friday the 7th of October. It is held at CTC. One of the reasons that of course is we want you to see where your son has been for the last four weeks. Uh, and it also allows us, of course, the opportunity to present to you the work that they have completed. Um, I think I've already mentioned that uh, the boys do outstanding work, uh, and I have to say the quality of the work has been improving as we go, mainly because we show the boys, here's what the last group did, this is what they did well, this is what they need to improve on, this is now the bar that you've got to get past, and um, the boys really um, take that on board. And because they're sort of standing on the shoulders of others, the, the, the quality of work has improved uh, in leaps and bounds. Uh, and I think you'll be really, really pleased with uh, what happens. So I uh, very much encourage you, if at all possible, you, you come along for this and get a sense of what the boys have done. So typically that will start at six o'clock. Uh, and we should uh, end ending, apparently. Uh, we'll end at around 7.45, um, depending on how many passion projects we have uh, to show you. Um, we're getting close to the end. Um, now, I noticed that Shanette has joined me. Shanette, did you want to uh, introduce yourself to the uh, the the families here, or will we leave that for later? Putting you on the spot. Hi, Mark. Yep, yeah, you did put me on the spot. Um, I was just in my pajamas a moment ago before that invitation. Uh, okay. I, <laughs> I'm really looking forward to working with um, the Year Nine boys in this. Uh, Hang on. Stop there. Oh, before yeah. you go, do you want me to put you on the screen? Say that again. Do you want me to put you on? I can put you on. On the screen if you like so they can see you because they can't see you at the moment okay that's fine sounds great all right hang on a sec and i'll tell you when to go okay we'll try can't do anything no i'm not going to get it Sorry, I mean, we're usually much smoother than this, uh, I have to say. I don't think it's going to let us do it. You could capture your screen. Uh, perhaps they don't need to look at you. You could just say something. <laughs> All right. 
All right, hi. I've uh, I've got short blonde hair and um, <laughs> and I have blue eyes and I'm looking forward to seeing you all on the um, 7th of October for when the boys come in to, to share their passion projects with you. And um, so I'll be working with the boys for the end of this term for the last two weeks and then uh, in the, at the start of term three, just before they finish up as well. So I'm really looking forward to being part of the program and um, following in the, the steps that Mark has laid for the group and myself. Oh, hang on. But here you go. You're coming on now. Just be careful. Right, you're live now. <laughs> so, as I said, short blonde hair, blue eyes, and uh, Mark. I'm not sure what else you'd like me to to say. He did really put me on the spot, everybody. Just so you know. I'm sorry. It's all right. Um, anyway, just so they they know you're a real person. <laughs> I'm a real person, and I'm not sure at the beginning, Mark. Did you introduce yourself and how long you've been at St Bernard's and, and things like that? Uh, uh, well, no, I didn't. I'd simply introduce who I was. <laughs> so some of you might have um, seen, because I've been at St Bernard's about 15 years, and um, so I probably taught quite a lot of the boys from this group in year seven and in year eight for sport as well. So I'll know quite a lot of the faces when I get in there, and um, I may look familiar to some of you already. So um, yeah, and I'm really, really looking forward to working the program and see it as a great opportunity for the boys to pick up and develop skills that will assist them beyond the gates of St Bernard's. And that's what I think Mark and I definitely have in common about just raising young men so they can be the best they can be when they leave the college and be successful in whatever pathway they choose in their final years at secondary school as well. And that's all I've got, Mark. Okay, no, that's good. I'm going to take it back now. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks, Chase. Yeah, I am sorry to put you on the spot, but I thought it's a golden opportunity when you just popped up there. I can throw you the deep end. Uh, we do have one question, which says, uh, "What socks do we wear with our runners? The grey school socks or the sports socks?" Um, if you are wearing long pants, then I, I guess you just wear the grey school socks. Um, otherwise, uh, sports socks will be fine. Um, I'm, I'm not going to get too fussed about that. I would suggest, though, that uh, if you show up, uh, the boys uh, who have uh, piercings typically want to show up with these giant zirconia things stuck in their ears. We'll ask them to take those out. So, um, now uh, there's also another one that came up. Do we get uh, Miss Glynn's phone number for the week? She's there, and she will actually end up with my phone because I'm going. To, it's a school phone, um, so she'll end up with the same number. So you can just keep using the same one. Okay, um, that's probably all we have for you at the moment. Uh, there's, there will be a recording of this uh, made available for you, and I'll be in communication as we go through um, this weekend, leading into next weekend. You'll, you'll get a uh, secret hearing from me, um, but uh, you know, I'm going to go off on long since you get a secret hearing from Jeanette. Uh, um, anyway, so thank you uh, once again for joining us. Uh, please feel free to get in touch if you have any further questions, but. Uh, I would encourage you also to try and make use of the material that's already been sent to you to get a sense of what we do. Okay, thank you everyone and good night.